it was so strong that we were in a in a place finishing some work full of ice but the the weather was good at the time when we were doing our work so the ice was not packed it was just like drifting ice all around we could sail around in between and uh, but the the weather was so bad offshore like further away uh, out of the bay that the ice started to be flushed from this bay and the waves started to grow and usually we like to shelter in between the ice and wait because it's flat it's uh, nothing is happening but now that the waves started to reach us despite the, the ice and there was not enough ice to to keep the sea flat which is usually uh, what happening so we ended up being stuck in the ice packed because of the wind but not enough ice to calm the sea so we were in a in the ice but with big waves wow. and then our boat was really bumping into the the ice flows all around for hours and hours and uh, in the end we really thought that boat was going to be smashed and and crashed Sejam muito bem-vindos a mais um podcast aqui do Maria Sonora e o episódio de hoje foi gravado em inglês. Para quem prefere ouvir esse episódio com legenda traduzida automaticamente para o português, é só acessar o bate-papo diretamente na plataforma YouTube. Lá você tem um recurso, acessa a legenda Escolhe para Português e aproveita a conversa de hoje. Um abraço e até mais! Welcome to Maria Sonora podcast. Uh, this is a podcast with uh, inst inspiring stories somehow related to the ocean. And I'm very happy today to receive a guest far, far away. I'm uh, in Italy. He's going to tell you where he is now. So Eric Prostier, very, very welcome to Maria Sonora podcast. I hope I said your name correctly. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much, Marina. And tell us where exactly are you at the moment? So I'm here in Saint Pierre and Miquelon. These are French islands close to Newfoundland, Newfoundland, Canada. So we are on the on the coast to the east coast of Canada in the North Atlantic Ocean. Today is minus eight, so not too cold, but it's pretty cold for for this place. And uh, because of the ocean, it's not so cold winter. And it's a very tiny place, only 6,000 people are living here. And this is where we are based with my family and my, and my boat since uh, 2021. And were you born uh, in France? Because I, I read something, maybe you were born in Japan or you were raised in France. Where, where do you come from exactly, Eric? Yeah, I'm born in Japan, that's right. But uh, I'm French, my parents are French and uh, they were just... Uh, living in Japan for a couple of years and uh, that's where I was born but uh, I, I must say I didn't stay a long time I cannot speak Japanese I, I just visited Japan again once when I was uh, 30 years old with my boat it was a nice trip but uh, no I it's just just uh, come like accident but my origins are French yeah. Because I read it uh, when I was reading about your bio prior to talking to you and preparing for our chat. I saw that you were very happy to be able to sail towards Japan when you were doing the the circumnavigation above the Arctic Circle. And I was like, oh, oh is he French or is Japanese? I, I have to ask him before anything else. <laughs> yes, no, that's right. But the, the, the project was uh, was amazing because... Uh, I bought this boat to support science in the Arctic. I bought the uh, Vagabond in, in 99. It's really a boat designed for the Arctic. But uh, the Arctic route is also the shortest one to go to Japan by, by boat compared to the southern route going through uh, around the uh, Middle East and then uh, around the Asia. So uh, I said, okay, I'm going back to my birthplace by the shortest route with my home boat. Uh, to know more about the Arctic and so it was a big bit of a challenge of course but uh, a great really great welcoming when we arrived in Japan. So you you went on Vagabond and Vagabond uh, for the curious for anyone listening to us what can you tell about her how can you describe the vessel? She's uh, 
rather average size for a sailboat, like uh, 15 meters or 47 feet. And uh, the, the, the specific uh, thing is she's really strong. She's really designed to sail in icy waters. Like she's very heavy. It's a steel, uh, mm. thick steel hull with uh, up to 10 millimeters steel. So it's up to maybe 30 tons sailboat, which is twice heavier than usual uh, sailing boats of the same size. So it's very strong and it's a lot of uh, storage capacity and everything is, uh, is made to be uh, self-sufficient for months and even uh, years if we would need to. So uh, it's very uh, uh, like the perfect tool for us to support science uh, in the Arctic, welcome uh, a few scientists and bring them to the work sites and, uh, and sometimes spend the winter, like we spend 12 winters on board the, this boat in the Arctic. Wow, 12 win winters, wow. Yeah, in the ice, yeah. So you, you, when you got her, you already had the idea in mind to, to be a vessel to support science. Uh, how, how exactly did it happen, Eric? Yeah, it's uh, actually 30 years ago, I was in a Southern Ocean subantarctic French station called uh, Kerguelen. Kerguelen Island is uh, yeah. south of the Indian Ocean. I was a geophysicist there doing my national service as a young, uh, young scientist. And uh, this is where I, I discovered how much I was uh, interested with science uh, to better understand our environment, our planet. And in these uh, remote regions, it's difficult to go there, to work there, to work safe. And uh, I thought, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to help and contribute to the science knowledge, to the knowledge of our planet in these remote regions. And uh, after all, a boat is the best mm -hmm. logistics you can think of. Yeah. And uh, this is how it started. And six years later, I bought, I bought this boat really uh, on purpose for to, to support uh, laboratories or universities and and bring them where they need to go and uh, and this is still what i'm doing since like 99. how many people can she accommodate yeah i would say maximum would be 10 but uh, we've been up to 14 with some people uh, sleeping in tents uh, on the beach nearby mm -hmm. but uh, it's better to stay up to seven eight max uh, and maybe only six in winter because mm -hmm. of the bigger equipment in winter like more clothing and everything so yeah six to ten i would say depending on the season and the work and what we have to do but usually the scientist uh, team is uh two three four five people but not not more like five is already a big team and you know they need to organize find uh, get the founding and everything so and then we are dedicated to one project which is the difference with bigger boats where they need to like to f to face all the costs they need to share the time and the logistic with uh, different programs in the same time and then they they won't be i mean most of the time they won't be working all together in the same time so they have to make a, a calendar schedule mm -hmm. which is not really happening with us we can change our course our route our objectives anytime which is because there is just one project on board and we are dedicated and it's very very nice it's and which, which uh, project are you talking about? What exactly is this project? Uh, like, for instance, now we have um, a three years project going on with the French Polar Institute, where we study tectonic in the uh, south of Greenland. Mm -hmm. So it's more geology, geophysics. Next summer, we'll have uh, 15 seismic stations, big, big seismic stations uh, to deploy. In winter, I'll have to do some maintenance of the stations and we will recover them uh, the next uh, summer, 2025. So that's a three years project. We started last summer and did some uh, field geology and sampling. And uh, the idea is to better understand how all this is uh, happening tectonic. You know, we, we don't know so much about the tectonic, the drift, continental drift, and, and uh, we really need to better understand how this all happened and where are we going now what's going to like which plate is going where and 
So it's really like a investigation and uh, the geologists are so excited doing this investigation, but the story started 1.2 billion years ago. So it's uh, another scale. It's, it's just fascinating to work with them, but still connected to our daily life to understand where we are going with uh, like so many questions we have, of course, now uh, regarding the future. So it's uh, all science approach is different. And uh, another project we work for since 2015 is uh, what we say sclerochronology. It's uh, a special uh, field, a special science to study the growth layers of one specific algae. Or it could be also some bivalves, some shells in the, in the, in the ocean. But uh, in this case, we study mainly uh, coralline algae, which grows, it's this kind of pink uh, color, pink color uh, algae that grows on rocks. Uh, all divers, in, uh, especially in uh, cold waters, they have seen this. It's uh, pretty much all, uh, all over. And it's growing very slowly, the body, like uh, corals. There is a carbonate uh, structure. And these growth layers, like growth layers for a tree, they will tell us the conditions of the ocean every year. And so if we find a specimen that are centuries old, which is the case, like in Labrador, we found up to seven centuries old uh, coralline. Oh. So we have the history on the seven last centuries of the ocean. If the ocean was warmer, colder, if there was more ice on top or less sea ice, because if there is lots of ice, there is less light and the algae will not grow so fast. If there is no ice, more light is coming and then the, the growth layer will be thicker. So it's a very, uh, uh, very interesting archives on the climate, on the ocean. And my job is to bring the scientists and to dive, to look for uh, this coralline algae and to dive and sample this, uh, this algae. And how I was... So that's one of the projects also. Sorry, sorry to, to break you. No, no, go ahead. I was curious when I saw some photos of, uh, of uh, dives, I th exactly the ones you were mentioning, it was... Uh, searching some photos on your website and what was what what are these dives like like what is the preparation to dive in uh, very cold waters how do you set the whole team to do it yeah so yeah first thing i try not to be alone i like for this project when we like next uh, june we'll be in labrador and uh, we, we should be two divers for safety, to help each other. And uh, also if one of us cannot uh, dive, we need to have at least one able to dive because uh, otherwise the project is standing by. But then in summer, it's not that uh, not that difficult. I mean, it depends sometimes with the current, could be a yeah. bit challenging, uh, some drifting ice. So we have to be very careful also with the, with the, with the ice. Like uh, two years ago, there was lots of ice and uh, it was drifting. The boat that was uh, waiting for us on uh, the surface uh, started to drift and the anchor didn't hold. So we, we noticed that the, the, the engine started. My wife, she was on board the, the ship, so she started the engine. And so we had to, uh, to finish our dive. By, by, by the time we came up, uh, the boat was already drifting and there was just like covered with ice on top. So we had to find a, a little gap to squeeze Wow. in between the ice and pop and jump on the ice. But our equipment is very heavy, so it's not very, not easy <laughs> to go on the ice. We are not like uh, seals <laughs> or polar bears. And there was one polar bear not too far. He was kind of watching us. So he stayed in a distance. So this was a good thing. But uh, yeah, sometimes it's a little bit uh, challenging. And uh, we need even more preparation when we dive in winter. Then in winter, it's, uh, it's so cold, we have to prepare with a warm shelter somewhere. It could be just a tent, mm. a very like, quick to set up, pop up tent. We put on the ice, we turn on a stove, just a camp stove or something. And then we can get ready in a warmer place and our equipment is not too cold. Uh, okay. And we, we don't get too cold. 
And then uh, we have the hole that we make uh, in the ice. That can take uh, a day to make the hole. You know, it could be can be hard work. Even if we don't make a hole too big, it still it makes, makes if the ice is a one one and a half meter thick, it takes some time. And then uh, then we have to to be very careful on the freezing of the equipment in winter because of salt. The water can uh, can freeze only uh, minus one point eight degrees, so the water is cold. It's almost minus two in the in the ocean when you dive in winter, so your equipment can freeze like it's below zero. So your equipment can freeze and then could uh, stop working properly. So we don't go too far from the from the hole we made in the ice. We stay not too far, and usually I stay with a rope, and my wife is holding me in the rope. So if I have a problem, I can pull the ropes three mm -hmm. times. And she knows she has to help me coming up. She, yeah, I mean, I did that twice. She was not so uh, confident, but uh, at least we know it works. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what about the the depth when you dive normally? How deep are these places? As we study uh, biology, like coralline, or sometimes I work on algae or sediment, we don't go too far deep. Like thirty meters is already mm -hmm. kind of deep. Maybe 30, 35 is really the maximum we would go for these dives. So it's uh, it's it's more uh, like 25, 30 meters max usually. So it's not too bad. I was looking at some very, very interesting moments of your life with your family. So the first big trip when you guys went uh, to do the Northeast Passage that you mentioned before, which is the shortest route, right? How was the how was that preparation? I mean, going back uh, twenty some something years ago, what do you recall from that trip, Eric? Yeah, the first idea was to, as I was telling you, uh, to go back to my birthplace. I thought, okay, that's pretty cool. It's the shortest route to uh, my uh, to Japan, and then it was also a very good reason to to know more about the Arctic, especially this side, the uh, Russian Arctic is not so well known. And uh, I mean, it's known by the Russians, but it's not so well known in our, like, uh, by general public. And then it was uh, also not very common, like no, no sailboat did that trip before without wintering, without help of uh, icebreaker. But I didn't realize it was going to take me three years to get all the paperwork done to get ready. And I, I went three times to, uh, to Moscow to prepare my, the trip. So it, it took me some, uh, some energy, eh? it took me some time. <laughs> but uh, I think if I would have known before, maybe I would have uh, not even tried. So it's good sometimes you don't know, it's going to be difficult. <laughs> but then we did it and we managed and we passed. We were just surprised to, to be on the other side within one month. So we spent the winter, we were so prepared to spend the winter somewhere in Russia, we, we decided to stay in Russia. We spent the winter in Kamchatka, it was a really great, uh, great time before going to Japan uh, the following spring. And then we went back by the other side, the, what we call the Northwest Passage. So after the Northeast Passage, we went by, back to Europe by the Northwest Passage. And it was just exactly 100 years after the first boat that passed the uh, Northwest Passage, Amundsen, in, in 1903. So we passed in, uh, in 2003, and we made this first trip around the Arctic, which was not really the, the, the main plan initially, but of course we are pretty happy to, to, to accomplish this. And the idea was also to make some, uh, to know better uh, our boat, to know better the Arctic, and then to offer better logistics to a scientific project. So during this trip around the Arctic, we didn't do science because it was too much of a challenge to already deal with the sailing, the paperwork, uh, the logistics. And we didn't want to commit ourselves into science. Otherwise, it's, you don't do good good job if you do too much things in the same time. But then it helped us to uh, yeah, to better know what we can offer, what we can do, how, how to sail this boat in the Arctic, what kind of crew we need, and 
And since then, we've been just full time working with science projects. How how far is I mean, what's the extension of the Northeast Passage, Eric? I was curious about the length. Um, it's a good question. I think we sailed, if I'm correct, uh, 20, 20,000 miles uh, around the Arctic, but including this uh, going down to Japan and back. Uh, then if you if you take from one strait to, to the other, because these passages like northeast and northwest are going from like officially from one strait to the other, I think it's about 3,000 nautical miles each. It's not, it's not so much, yeah. Not so long, actually. That's why it's an interesting shortcut. But of course, if you have the permissions and the mm -hmm. good uh, sailing conditions, like sometimes it can still be uh, icy and, and the maps are not uh, the same than in uh, more popular places. And uh, is Vagabond, an, is that a, she's not an icebreaker, is she? Is like a, a reinforced who, or is she an icebreaker? I wasn't sure about that either. Yeah, I would say it's a very, very small icebreaker. Like ah, okay. in, in regards that the bow is uh, is icebreaking type, not like uh, other sailboat. It's uh, above the water. So it, if when we meet ice, it goes uh, gently on top of the ice flow. Not an iceberg, of course, but uh, like uh, flat ice, sea ice, would go on top. And with the weight, as I was telling you, it's very heavy. She's 30 tons. So it would, uh, with the weight, it will break the ice. And uh, this is a way to, to, to go through sometimes. In a, it, but we won't break more than 40, 50 centimeters, like, which is quite, quite big already. But uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not many sailboats of this size able to, to break ice, of course. And uh, we've been in really tough conditions. There is some video on our on our web page which can sh show that two years ago we were really in tough conditions. But uh, yeah, Vagamon is amazing. Yeah. And you guys had a you mentioned some pro some problems like uh, bureaucracy wise. In order to continue, you had to have a, a Russian person on board to be authorized to keep on in the beginning. How was that exactly? Yeah, I would say it's, it's not really problems. It's just like uh, there is no uh, website to explain what you have to do if you want to do uh, a trip in the uh, Russian Arctic. So, uh, I mean, at that time, let's speak about that time. So uh, it's just you have to understand the, the laws and the regulation by meeting the right people. So it takes a lot of time. And uh, in, in Moscow, uh, I was talking to the head of uh, the um, administration of the Northern Sea Route. This is how the Russians call the North East Passage. This, they call it the Northern Sea Route. Ah, okay. And they said, okay, you, you're good to go. You don't need a pilot uh, because we've sailed already two uh, seasons in Greenland. They've seen uh, what we could do. And they said, I don't think we need, you need a pilot. You're, you're good to go. And, but then in, in Murmansk, the harbor authorities and the, and the people dealing with the, the paperwork at our departure, uh, they said uh, they would rather have us with a, a pilot. But then I explained we had no budget for that. We didn't prepare as the Moscow people said we could go without. And then uh, they helped us to find a retired uh, <laughs> a pilot that was volunteering to join us. And then everybody was happy, you see. Uh, now I think. That was, that was solutions and uh, everybody was helpful. And uh, seven years later, I, I kept good relation with the authorities. I was myself uh, a pilot, ice pilot uh, in, in the northern, uh, northern sea route in Russia again, on board a different, uh, uh, a different boat, a bigger boat, expedition boat too. So, uh, no, you know, it's just a matter of uh, trust and uh, and good relations and experience and and what do you remember in terms of uh, wildlife uh, experiences because i saw in some of your videos there i think i believe you are probably one of the uh, the persons who most uh, frequently have encountered polar bear in your life right i mean you I imagine you probably lost the account of how many times you saw a polar bear. What can you tell yeah, about course. that one? 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, some people would be living uh, all their life in in polar bear places, so they they would probably see more than us, of course. But uh, we've been we've been uh, in places where we really up up to fourteen bears uh, in one day. So yeah, it's been 14? Uh, sometimes for zero, yeah, fourteen. For- 14, wow. 14, uh, and uh, that's a uh, breakup time when the ice is breaking up. And then, then you have a lot of seals uh, enjoying the sun on the ice. And then it's the last chance for <laughs> easy hunting before the complete breakup, like when the ice starts drifting away. And uh, in Svalbard, we saw all, almost 800 uh, polar bears. We counted, like some of could have been the same, you know, they, wow. they come back in a few days later. I'm not too sure if the same, but we counted uh, uh, 800 visits, about almost 800 visits at the boat in five uh, in five years. But since then, we I, I stopped counting. Yeah, because this was already uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> year to 2000. So. But... Uh, we never had, the main thing is we never had uh, any serious accident, except uh, one of our dogs got killed once because he was just uh, disturbing too much and we we didn't hear the, the bear coming and uh, I guess the bear wanted to mainly play because he didn't even eat the dogs and the other dogs didn't get hurt. So not too sure what happened exactly, but that's the only accident we, we had otherwise. We, we always have a, uh, a good time watching each other, like the polar bears would be very curious and come sometimes closer and watch and uh, any time in the year, I could be in winter or in, in summer. And, and uh, if they get too close now, we know at some point we have to, to make uh, some sound that, you know, it could be just a pot. Uh, you don't need a, we don't use any rifles or ammunition anymore. I mean, we have them in case, but, uh, we hardly use them and uh, just make a, some disturbing noise, but just uh, when the the, the, the the animal is very close and that's enough, that's enough. Uh, so we've been learning how to live together, yeah. This, this period that you spent uh, five years wintering in uh, Spitsbergen, the biggest island of the Svalbard archipelago in Norway, how did you guys end up there? Tell, tell a bit of the, about the project, because there's also a very, very nice video uh, showing some of the experiences. I would love to hear about it. Yes, uh, it was during the Paris boat show where our boat was uh, on an exhibition after our trip around the Arctic. They invited us to, to be there, to, uh, to be guest of the boat show that the one scientist uh, came and said, okay, well, what are you doing now? And I have a project for you in Svalbard. And it all started with some uh, uh, support from the French Polar Institute. And then came uh, the International Polar Year. And then in the end, we renew and uh, keep renewing our our projects and more more science and different countries and uh, all this uh, European, European Damocles uh, science, big science project. And was, that's how we stayed five years in a row. And uh, we stayed on the East Coast, uh, which is the cold coast where you have uh, sea ice uh, nine months a year. You have no, nobody living on this side. Everybody is living on the West uh, Coast of uh, Longabin, uh, of, uh, sorry, of uh, Spitsbergen, because uh, of uh, warmer currents makes the fjords and the ice uh, not too much in this side. So you can sail and you can access the West Coast much more easily, which is uh, not possible on the East Coast. We were really remote in the ice, but beautiful. And uh, after these five years in Svalbard, we so we knew what it was to do science, winter, summer. We were sailing around in summer and uh, we knew uh, what we could do in uh, for science with our boats, but we we are missing uh, real Arctic culture, which doesn't really exist in Svalbard because no no population never reached these uh, these islands before uh, recent uh, recent days. So when we had the opportunity to to work in uh, Greenland and uh, Nunavut, Nunavut is the uh, Canadian Arctic. That's how we, we moved on this side. And then since, since then, we've been working mainly in uh, Nunavut and Greenland. 
So it's our first uh, first winter. There was uh, twelve years ago already, even thirteen years ago. So that's where we spent uh, all these last uh, twelve years, yeah, mainly working summer and winter. But in but in Sp in uh, in Spitsbergen on the island, uh, so you're you're staying sailing around uh, when the ice melted in the summer, and then you went back to the same spot where the ice would uh, block the the boat and stay there analyzing the this the the air uh, conditions what exactly were you doing when you were winter in uh in the archipelago yes that's right yeah, in in summer we would uh, sail with different science projects in the uh, in svalbard sailing around september we would we would have been uh, preparing vagabond in uh, nialesun is the friend uh, the international okay. science station north of uh, svalbard on the west coast uh, so with the with the support of this the, the station we would prepare vagabond and then sail back to the east coast and the freeze up was in uh, sometime in uh, october okay with the beginning of the dark period like for three and a half months you had no 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 sun and the breakup was only in july around the uh, between yeah I think the all the breakups were between 15th and 20th of uh, July so pretty sharp schedule <laughs> and uh, a long long winter then from October to July is winter October to July so you have only August to sail around and September to get ready for the next winter so it was pretty uh, yeah focused on winter and uh, the main project was uh, we had was a uh, to study the sea ice and to contribute to a better model of sea ice, to understand the dynamic, the geophysics, the, even the biology of the sea ice. So we had all type of measurements to do all year long, uh, ocean measurements, uh, snow measurements, ice measurements, and also atmospheric measurement, like with uh, all kinds of tools and instruments. Sometimes, uh, of course, we would welcome scientists for one week, two weeks, and sometimes we would just keep going the, the routines on a regular basis, like every every second day, every other day, we would uh, do the work, the field work. So it was really very interesting. And this is uh, in the third winter out of five, we got our first child. She was uh, she was not born on the ship, but almost. Mm -hmm. We we got a uh, support from the the governor, the Svalbard governor. And we we could access to the nearby. I mean, the, the closest hospital where they give birth is uh, Tromsø, so northern Norway. And then we were back on our boat. Just she was uh, ten days old or more or less. Can't remember exactly, but maybe eight days. So it was a really really quick. And uh, this is how we started. Uh, we 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 started the the pro we kept going the project, and it started to be a family project. <laughs> Yeah, it's incredible. You can see some footages uh, with the first one, of the first daughter, and playing on the sledge and going uh, with your partner and, uh, and the dogs too to melt the, uh, the the water to make water. I mean, to catch the first catch the ice and then to take on board and melt it. It's really incredible those footages. Yeah, yeah. We learned to have a very very simple life actually, but uh, it's very pleasant. You know, you feel. You feel you are not uh, wasting anything. You are really uh, enjoying your environment. You are not uh, disturbing your environment, especially when you are wintering. There is, you are, you are not running any engine. It's very quiet, and you you feel you are part of the uh, landscape completely. And uh, we we used, we just take what we need a little bit for sun and wind for power, and uh, ice for for drinking water. It's better than uh, to take land ice from glacier because sea ice can be salty and land ice is uh, is older with uh, has some minerals so it's better better than snow for you you mentioned uh, you're very self-sufficient how did you exactly uh, supply the 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 needs of uh, electricity to be warm on board how did that work for you in the winter to. It was based on we on the because you have I mean you have the almost endless night right it's a few hours of sun how do you deal with that moment? 
with that circumstances sorry yeah when when you have no no sun and no wind like no possibility to use your your wind generator or, or solar panel then uh, for energy for electricity although we don't need too much but we we run our generator it's a diesel generator and uh, for heating we have a diesel stove and uh, on board the Vagabond, we can store up to over 4,000 liters of uh, diesel, which is a lot compared to maybe 10 times more than uh, normal sailboats of this size. But this is really on purpose for to be self-sufficient for winter. And uh, of course, as soon as the sun is back, with all these uh, windows we have, it's like a greenhouse. And we, we get a lot of uh, heat from the sun as soon as it's back but uh, during the dark period during the polar night of course yeah, we we need uh, we need some power and diesel was the best but uh, actually we don't use we use less diesel than a house in a in more average climate even if we were in minus 30 minus 40 sometimes it's a small small uh, volume to heat it's pretty well uh, insulated so it's a good good balance yeah it's not too bad <laughs> yeah the, you you you've seen we say just a few minutes before you probably have uh, had many many encounters with uh, polar bears and also i imagine with northern lights right you have probably seen so yes. many how how were these moments for you i think one of the best thing i like to do is uh just to go out stay on the ice well dressed with my camera just to pretend uh, i want to take pictures but it's a good <laughs> way to stay out and watch really <laughs> this this it's a complete show it's really the the, the when the, the northern light is strong all the surface of the snow turned a little bit uh, green and uh, the the atmosphere is just like uh, incredible you cannot be uh, you're never fed up with such a nice, uh, <laughs> yeah, beautiful show. Yeah, yeah. and uh, sometimes even a little bit of red or purple. Or, uh, but depending on places, uh, they are different. Like uh, there are some better spots, and also you need a you need a clear sky, of course. So it's it's good when you live in a in a place where it's uh, good weather, uh, pretty yeah, pretty often, like clear sky. <laughs> Do you remember one particular occasion that uh, some that happened, a special one? Like if you could say, well, just go to this or that country, it's more likely to see Northern Lights. What, what would you say about that? Do you recommend any spot in particular? I think for uh, for Europeans, it's uh, it's good to go in Northern Norway, but inland to a few hours along the coast, it's probably more clouds, more uh, snow precipitation, more clouds. So if you go more inland, you get better weather and like a uh, clear sky and then more chance to, to watch them. And it's a very good spot to to watch Northern Lights. But then if you are more on the America side, you, you go in, in North Canada, same thing, more inland, not, mm -hmm. not too much towards the ocean to get better weather. But just look for, uh, yeah, access to uh, Arctic from where you are and then uh, study the, the the weather the mm. average weather because the, you want to be in a in a clear sky region <laughs> there is a brazilian guy who lives in alta north of tromso and uh, mm -hmm. is he does a very interesting job uh, he's uh, explaining mostly like geographically confusion that normal people do normally people do do between northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere and he talks about the northern lights so much so beautiful the and it's a tiny, tiny place north of, I don't know how, how north from Toronto, but uh, it's meant to be a very uh, frequent place to, to observe the northern lights from out. Have you been there? Yeah, we've been uh, in Tromsø in, in winter, but not in uh, Alta. But, no. uh, yeah, we, we, this is where our daughter was born in Tromsø, so we've been there for a while. And uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's pretty well known place for sure. Yeah, and, and also the moonlight on the on the snow is, is beautiful. Just yeah, a yeah. full moon, you know, on the snow. It's just uh, because it's so bright uh, on the on the snow when when everything is white, 
it's like a perfect reflection. You don't need any headlamp, any hmm. any light anymore. When you have a full moon, you can switch off your light, and uh, it's during the dark period. It makes you. Uh, it's like almost like daylight. <laughs> it's only when the sun is back, you realize, okay, the sun is strong too. <laughs> And talking about the, watching your two daughters grow in such a special environment, how, how do you feel about it? How do you, what can you say about some unique moments or the way you see them reacting to the, to the normal wildlife? And uh, how, do you, how do you see them? How do you perceive them? I think we've been learning a lot uh, Although we, we, we had some experience before, we've been learning a lot just by watching our, our kids growing. Because for them, there was no difference. I mean, this was just part of their, of their life. They, they grew up in this uh, environment, this way of life. So they, they didn't have to learn from knowing something different before. They just knew right away what they had to do. You know, they a kid is growing and uh, adapting i mean he's, he's learning how to uh, do things walk eat dress play uh, by in just a way adapted to to the environment so it was very interesting for us our difference is we we had to learn everything but they it, for them was just like obvious and also by the fact we were in a relation with the uh, Inuit communities. So they had a lot of interactions with kids of the, uh, like Inuit kids, they were going to school. And so all this uh, was really very inspiring for us. And uh, what we can say, it's fascinating how much human being can adapt to uh, a different climate, different way of life, different conditions, which is uh, good to know with what's happening today on a uh, changing climate. So uh, it is possible really to adapt to uh, a lot of things different. The people traveling, they know about this. And uh, of course it was a little bit of uh, like a little bit of extreme adaptation, but it's possible. And uh, it's very uh, inspiring to, uh, to keep this in mind. Yeah. I was reading Eric the other day the number of uh, people who was uh, the number of people visiting Antarctic in the extreme opposite this year like roughly 100,000 for this season. Yeah. I heard also that in uh, in the Spitsbergen region a lot of people also are going during the summer of course uh, the European summer to see polar bears to see the environment over there. How do you see this uh, impact this tourism impact? Oh, uh, in both regions, in the, in the Arctic and in Antarctica, how do you perceive this situation? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's impossible to stop this completely. Uh, we are part of the people showing how beautiful it is in these regions, and we cannot blame anyone They're willing to to try and see these uh, beautiful places. So I think we have to work together to educate on uh, how fragile it is to regulate tourism, to organize it. And uh, this, this, is, uh, this has to be done not only for the big cruise ship, but also for all kind of uh, even smaller boats or other, other way of uh, visiting. Because in Svalbard, for instance, lots of uh, snowmobiles, tools in winter, or like in spring. Uh, so we, we have to to work together with uh, the travel agencies, with the, 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 the people organizing these tours. And they, they want to, to keep their business running, but they also want to protect, to pre preserve what they like, what they want to share with their guests. So I think this is the, the key, is to really discuss on uh, how to better regulate better protect, but we, we don't want to, uh, to say it's uh, forbidden, it's impossible. As a, as a sailor and as a traveler, uh, when you talk about uh, climate change, usually the difficulty is because you need a time frame of uh, decades, right, when you, when you want to compare. As, as someone who has traveled for decades already, do you see 
differences? Do you see environmental changes in uh, in any way? How do you how do you see? Well, like if people ask you, okay, have you seen any changes? Have you seen any uh, ice melting or any other direct effect effect of a, a change in the climate? Do you do you have anything about it to to say? Yeah, th there are some places where we didn't even know we, we could reach one day, like 20 years ago. But now, uh, because there was so much ice, it was not even visible uh, from, the, from the satellite view because it was just always covered with ice. And now it's no more ice. So then you have a, a new base, new little shelter. You can come in, uh, the, you, we discover a new coast because of the melt of the ice. And uh, it's also the case in all these fjords where you have a, a major glacier in the end, they are going like they are retreating fast, like 100 meters every year or, or so average, depends where. But uh, in, a, in a few years, you, you can sail into a fjord where it was not possible uh, before. So, and then you access new. Uh, feeding places for for wildlife, and then you discover a new uh, uh, a new environment in the, in the fjord that was covered with ice for so many centuries, and then suddenly it's uh, exposed to uh, ocean and sun and climate, and so the changes are really big. We can see them within 20 years. We've seen really big changes, but like some animals also, there is. Uh, some some Arctic villages they didn't know about mosquitoes and now they have to learn how to fight mosquitoes and they are even scared by mosquitoes not by polar bears or wolves <laughs> but they are scared by mosquitoes you know so you have to learn but I was as I was saying a human being can adapt but uh, it's not only the, the matter of adapting is uh, what should we do to maybe uh, reduce the impact as we know these changes are mainly because of uh, humans on earth so how what can we do to reduce this uh, our impact like humans impact uh, that's that's the thing we we all would like to to go ahead to push forward eh? do you do also photographic uh, cruises eric or, or are you basically basically doing uh, scientific uh, expeditions how are your trips exactly no we do we do also welcome uh, photographers filmmakers and uh, artists and uh, i think uh, although I, i have a science background uh, I, i think science is not the only approach to understand and to study and to share uh, knowledge about uh, the environment so i think it's very important to to be open to all, all kind of uh, means of uh, sharing the, the knowledge, uh, like what you are doing by uh, allowing some mm. people like me to share, you know, what we are doing, what we are discovering. And uh, we, I think we need all kind of uh, uh, approach and, and sensibility. So we are always happy to have uh, photographers and uh, or filmmakers, journalists, artists. Very happy to know that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Speaking about your trip to Devon Island, I think. Uh, please correct me if I if I yeah. make any mistakes. You went through a very tricky moment in 2022 that the boat was uh, trapped in ice. Uh, I would like to hear about that uh, episode, Eric. Please. Yeah, that's really one sign of the the change, like climate change, because the weather forecast is more and more difficult to uh, like to be accurate. And uh, we had a, a like bad weather that was forecast, but not not as bad as, as uh, we we had it actually. It was so strong that we were in a in a place finishing some work, full of ice. But uh, the weather was good at the time when we were doing our work. So the ice was not packed. It was just like drifting ice all around. We could sail around in between. And uh, But the, the weather was so bad offshore, like further away, 
uh, out of the bay that the ice started to be flushed from this bay and the waves started to grow. And usually we like to shelter in between the ice and wait because it's flat, it's, uh, nothing is happening. But now that the waves started to reach us despite the, the ice and there was not enough ice to, to keep the sea flat, which is usually uh, what happening. So we ended up being stuck in the ice, packed because of the wind, but not enough ice to calm the sea. So we were in, a, in the ice, but with big waves. Wow. And then our boat was really bumping into the the ice flows all around for hours and hours. And uh, in the end, we really thought the boat was going to be smashed and, and crashed. It was really hard, even hard to speak, you know, it was so loud, the bumps and the shocks. And the, so, and it, it was not for a few minutes, it was for hours. So we got scared. Huh? We, we thought we had to evacuate and take all our emer emergency gear on the ice, but then what? Thank you so much for listening to another chat here on Maré Sonora podcast. I hope you have enjoyed it. And if you like to check out the entire conversation, there are many possibilities. You can check them all on the website, www.podcastmaresonora.com. I will also leave the link directly in the show's notes so you can click on there and go through the best option. If you choose to listen to the podcast on Spotify, you can directly subscribe through there. And the good thing is, not only you have access to this chat, but to all of the complete episodes that have been already launched. So not only one, but more than 20 available. Another possibility is contribute through YouTube, and then I will follow you the link through your email. Pick the one that suits you better and I'll be very happy to hear your thoughts and what you thought about this chat. I see you soon and until then, fair wings to all of you. Muito obrigada por chegar até aqui e conferir mais um podcast do Mara Sonora. Se você quiser conferir o episódio até o final, completo, existem várias formas, várias alternativas para apoiar e participar. Recentemente eu disponibilizei um mecanismo de assinatura diretamente no Spotify. Funciona super fácil, você pode acessar diretamente na plataforma clicar no episódio pago e aí você vai ter toda a orientação por e-mail para participar. A assinatura no Spotify te dá direito a aproveitar não só esse episódio de hoje, como todos os outros já lançados. São mais de 20 para você aproveitar. Para quem preferir fazer uma contribuição via Pix, a chave Pix do Mara Sonora é podcastmarasonora.gmail.com Nesse caso, é fundamental que você coloque na mensagem do Pix o seu e-mail e qual episódio quer ouvir, que aí, em até um dia, eu reencaminho para você o link e você confere pelo YouTube. Outras alternativas de apoiar e participar aqui do Maré Sonora estão disponíveis no site www.podcastmaresonora.com. Acesse a seção Apoie e escolhe a melhor opção para você. Lá você vai conferir também o nome de todas as pessoas que já apoiaram, a quem eu agradeço demais. A gente se vê então no próximo episódio e eu desejo a todos vocês, como sempre, bons ventos.